Hey everyone, welcome to the Menlo Minute Quarantine Edition. We're so glad we could be with you today. My name is Matt, this is Heather. We are part of your online team and it is our pleasure to be with you. So uh, I gotta say, Heather, I am super grateful in this season because uh, as you know, I'm a New York native uh, and moved to the Bay Area in February, so I'm still quite new, but I got to celebrate for the first time ever a Friendsgiving, to be in the company of friends who cooked a beautiful meal for us. I mean, it was, it was awesome. And, and yeah, 2020 has been hard, I admit that, but I found a lot of great reasons to be thankful and sitting in the company, company of friends, socially distanced, was um, a real blessing and a joy to my little heart. Um, what are you thankful for in this season? I'm thankful for so many things. Um, I'm still thankful for family, my kids. I don't, a lot of people, I don't know, may not be able to say that, um, but I am with <laughs> my family. Um, we had our own little, like five of us, we made turkey legs and regular Thanksgiving side dishes and we had a great Thanksgiving so I had no complaints. That's fantastic. And I mean, here we are now, I can't believe it. We're talking, you know, Thanksgiving has concluded and we're talking about Christmas already. Uh, the music has been turned up in my house. Decorations are materializing everywhere. Do you have your tree up? We don't have a tree yet. Um, oh. We don't have a tree yet. I, do you have your tree up? My tree is up. We do artificial in our house, um, mainly because we try to do a real tree one year and it died right before Christmas. And I'm still finding like old Christmas tree needles in my car. That was about 10 years ago, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a traumatic experience to have a tree go on you before Christmas. Um, we, we're generally real tree people, uh, but this will be my first experience cutting down a real tree on the West Coast. So I don't know if you have Norway spruces out here. We're, we're generally Norway, occasionally blue spruce. So I'm pretty particular on my Christmas trees. Uh, but one thing we have to watch out for this year is that we have a pup and I don't want him eating the tree. Um, or drinking I heard the that water. they tend to do that. Or drinking the water either, yeah. So uh, yeah, vet bills can be expensive. Uh, so we're gonna be real careful about that this year. Thankfully, the kids are grown, so um, we don't have to worry about them eating the tree, which is good. Um, so we've got a lot of great things coming up uh, for Christmas, right? I, 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 a few services, a few things happening, right? Yep, it starts December 6th, our Advent series. It's called The Good Shepherd. I'm already starting to think about now who I'm gonna be inviting to our Advent series and our Christmas Eve services. It's gonna be a great time. So definitely wanna check it out. It starts December 6th. Awesome. Looking forward to that. And something else that I'm excited for today, we get to hear from our transitional pastor, John Crosby. Um, we have spent a lot of time in prayer, uh, just waiting for his arrival. And uh, it's been great to get to know him over the past couple of weeks. He's been a real blessing to our staff. And, uh, and as much as I'm excited for Christmas, I'm even more excited for next year and the season we're gonna be stepping into as a church and the opportunities that we're going to have um, to serve the Bay Area and beyond. So good things are happening. So if you're just joining us or you're a regular viewer online, please, oh please stay connected to us. Make sure you fill out a connection card. Um, we wanna maintain uh, a good relationship with you as you do the same with us in this season. Uh, yes, we are far apart, but we are still together in many ways. And with that, we're gonna jump into our service today. Peace. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but
great rescue that our God made, pulling us from the heaviness of our sin into the glory of his love. I need a rest, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven.
joy of this season, we give God great thanks as we sing to Him to express our gratitude that He came to earth to be with us. Oh, sing joy. Thanks for joining us for worship this weekend. You know, with the holidays upon us, having just celebrated Thanksgiving and uh, Advent starting already, uh, there's a, so much for us to be thankful for, but I really do miss being able to gather together physically in the same space. I miss being able to just chat and connect over donuts or coffee or meeting new folks in the lobby or the patio. So at some point, we will be able to gather again in one space. In the meantime, the best way to stay connected at each one of our campuses is through our campus Facebook groups. You can chat, you can join watch parties, interact while watching the service. Uh, we have uh, different games and questions of the week. You can interact with one another 24 seven. And I know some folks right now are pretty wary of social media. I just wanna say you can create a Facebook account do just one thing. Join a Menlo Church campus Facebook group. It's a private group. Uh, you won't regret doing that. And uh, I also want to encourage you to join us for our Christmas services this year. Uh, we're having some amazing things uh, planned that uh, you're just going to love. It'll be on December 23rd, 24th. Wherever you are in the world, you can tune in and take part in our celebration of the fact that Jesus has come into our world. So save the date for that. And finally, I just want to say thank you for your continued generosity to Menlo Church. Your giving of any amount, your tithes, your offerings help bring hope they bring healing. They support recovery groups and life groups and ministry to hundreds of kids every week. And our student ministries, middle school, high school students, 
You're giving makes things possible like Hotel de Zinc that right now in the months of November and December at our Menlo Park campus provides overnight shelter for people in our community who are experiencing homelessness. Every gift right now, especially as we approach the end of the year, can make a huge difference in the trajectory of the ministry of Jesus in the Bay Area and beyond for years to come. So thank you for doing that. And right now, it is my pleasure to welcome, for his first sermon at Menlo Church, our new transitional pastor, John Crosby. Well, uh, good morning, Menlo. Uh, I'm John Crosby, and it, it looks like we'll be taking part of this journey together for the next several months. And I'm delighted that Laura and I have a chance to be part of this, not just this church, but this movement that for over 140 years has been seeing people come to the kingdom and follow Jesus. We're looking forward to it. We hope we can learn uh, together. You know, places like Menlo can be pretty intimidating. The size and the, the history, the people, the great pastors, all the different campuses here. But Eugene Peterson, the pastor, reminded me there are no successful churches there are only collections of broken sinners around the world who are being redeemed by grace. I'm trying to remember that so that I don't get intimidated and try to be somebody that I'm not. I love that the, my first act here, uh, the first Monday that I showed up remotely from Minnesota, uh, was to be able to pray with our elders and our senior staff. They asked me to set the tone, and I, and I said to them, that one of my professors had said that uh, in the Bible, last words are meant to last. They're supposed to stick with you. But first words set the tone. And then I read the first words that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Paul said this. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I didn't come preaching God's secret with fancy words or a show of human wisdom. I decided that while I was with you, I'd forget about everything except Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So when I came to you, I was weak and fearful and trembling. My teaching and my preaching weren't with words of human wisdom that persuade people, but with proof of the power that the Spirit gives. And that was so that your faith would be in the power of God and not in human wisdom. And that's the way Paul started. That's what I want to do, to let us have a season here together that's focused on Jesus and see what the power of God can do among us. So this morning, I'd, I'd like to share what that might look like from the end of the same note that the apostle wrote to that church in Corinth that he approached with fear and trembling. In my uh, last church, I'll talk about it a lot, I'm sure. I was there for 30 years. It was called CPC. Christ Presbyterian Church. And every year at CPC, we gave second graders Bibles. And, uh, you know, the first year that I was there, it was 20 Bibles and uh, 40 and 60 and 90. Uh, by the time I left, it, it was over 150 Bibles. And that week before the Bibles were handed out, I would do two things. I, I decided that I would sign each of the Bibles and then for each child that I'd underline one verse in their book. And we'd gather the kids together and I would say to them, I want you to look up my favorite verse in the Bible. It has all kinds of stories in it, but I'd like you to turn to the very first letter that the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth. That's a, that's a city in Greece. You can have your mom and dad show you what it looks like. And at the end of that letter, in the 15th chapter, the Apostle Paul writes this, and I want you to underline this verse in your second grade Bible. We give the kids magic markers. And I say to them, this is my favorite verse. It's not your favorite verse, but it's about me. And the passage starts out by Paul saying, I'm the least of all of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be a leader in the church because I persecuted the people of God. Eugene talked about that in the last couple of weeks. That's Paul's story. He chased and harmed those who started to follow Jesus. And then my favorite verse 
is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. I don't even deserve to be an apostle, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And God's grace to me has not been without effect. That's my verse. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me has not been without effect. The Apostle Paul says, no, I I worked harder than anybody else. Not, Not that it was me working hard. It was God's grace in me working hard. And so I'd like to talk to you today about the impact that grace has made in my life and the impact that God's grace wants to make at Menlo Church. Philip Yancey says that the word grace is the last, best, unspoiled word of the English language. Grace is something good that we get that we just don't deserve. We don't deserve grace. We just get it. You don't define it. You don't study it. You experience it. And I believe that grace is a key to life itself. So that's where I want to start today. Do you feel like you are experiencing grace? Where do you find grace? Where do you get enough grace to be filled to live on it? Or is that not your experience? I I mentioned Yancey's book. It's really one of the best books I've I've ever read. It's called What's So Amazing About Grace? And he grabs me right at the start. Yancey says, recently I've been asking questions of strangers. For example, people that sit on airplanes with me when I strike up a conversation. Yancey said, I I ask them, when I say the word Christian or evangelical Christian, what comes to mind? And Yancey said, "Uh, in reply, mostly what I hear are political descriptions of strident pro-life activists or gay rights opponents or fanatics of this kind or judgmental people of that kind. Not once, Yancey says, not once in the more than a year that I did this did I ever hear Christians describing as smelling of grace. Uh, Apparently, grace is not the aroma that Christians usually give off in the world. That's not only a shame, it means we're missing the only thing that we can do. Gordon MacDonald writes, the world can do almost anything as well or better than the church. You don't have to be a Christian to build houses or feed the hungry or heal the sick. There's only one thing that the world cannot do. The world cannot offer grace. MacDonald puts his finger right on it. Where else can the world go to experience grace. And if it doesn't experience grace in the church, then what'll happen to that group of people that say that they want to follow Jesus? So again, are you experiencing grace? I hope that we'll have a chance to get to know each other over the months that we have ahead of us, hopefully at some point face to face. But I already know that we have something in common. Because I grew up in a pretty dysfunctional home. A dysfunctional home like every single one of your homes, like every home in America. Dysfunctional. But in my house, it showed a little bit more. With all the drinking and all the fighting, all the instability, I grew up feeling like I was only going to be loved as long as I did whatever it took to be approved of, to be be loved. And from my mom... It meant that I should work harder and that I should study and that I should get good grades because that's what she valued. I'd impress my dad by being a good athlete, by working hard at sports. I, I wanted so much to be loved by my friends that even when I knew their standards weren't the same as ours, I followed them. They didn't care about grades, so I didn't. They wanted to be wild people, and I thought, well, maybe if I was one of those wild guys they'd love and accept me. And so I lived a life doing whatever it took to be loved and accepted. By the time I got to college, I had totally drifted away from the church. My parents were very nominal Catholics, put us in parochial school and never went themselves. And at church, I'd hear people say that I was a sinful person, that I'd done bad things all week. And I'd say, boy, I I already know that. They'd say that I'm not only sinful, but that God was mad at me. They had categories they they put me in. 
whether I was going to go to limbo, actually that would have been good for me, or purgatory or hell, or I was exposed to mortal sin, it was the way I felt God felt about me. So first, I left the Catholic Church. No great loss to them. And then I left Christianity, and then by the time I was halfway through high school, I left God altogether. But at the end of high school, the beginning of college, I bumped into a group of people that seemed to love me differently. They didn't get impressed when I did something good, and they didn't seem surprised when I messed up. They just seemed to want to love me anyway. They were Christians, and I didn't hold that against them. I, I, I didn't want to be a Christian, but I wanted to be like those people. I wanted to be loved by those people. Since they were followers of Jesus, I went to one of their youth groups. And even though I didn't believe anymore, at this point, I wanted to become like them because they made me feel loved no matter how I acted. And they started to talk to me about Jesus, past my intellectual doubts or my pseudo-intellectual arguments. They described Jesus as the person that reached out to those who were way out there, the one who spent time with prostitutes and tax cheats and anybody who felt far from God. And to the folks far from God, he offered them what he called good news. Finally, these friends turned to me and said, you know, John, um, we like you, but, but God wants to love you just that way. God wants to love you when you mess up so bad that nobody else will love you. He, he wants to have you recognize that you don't have to do anything to be better. You just have to recognize that you're already a child of God. Do you think you want that? Well, at first, I, I didn't. I, I let it sit with me for months. I checked out Christianity intellectually. I, I listened, and more important, I watched my friends. And they started to tell me stories out of this book about prodigal sons who ran far away, who show up broken, and a father who doesn't yell at them but embraces them. And they talked about grace. So one night on a skating rink in the middle of winter in Chicago, I went out on the ice skating pond and I said, God, I'm not sure, but I sense you're here. I need to know that no matter what I do, you'll love me anyway. Even if nobody else does, I'm sorry for all the stuff I've done in the past, all the stuff nobody's even found out about. And I'm sorry about all the stuff I'm going to do because I, I know I'm going to mess up. But I'm tired of trying to measure up so people will love me. And I said, God, if I try to love you, will you still love me? Will you always love me no matter what? And that night, God's love and God's grace became the reason that I'm still here. You know, too often people outside the faith look at Christians and say, it's about what you believe, and beliefs are important. Some people have a checklist of all the things to believe. Or other Christians say that they are people who behave, who do this and don't do that and don't ever do that. But are followers of Jesus the people who believe or the people who behave? I, I don't think so. Christians are the people who have heard God say to them, I love you. I forgive you. Can I put my love inside you so deep that no matter what you do, you'll believe that I still love you? It's a gift. You can't earn it. You're not that good. You can't try that hard. You can't jump that high. But I sent my son Jesus to show you what my love looks like, to live with you and to die for you so that you'd believe it when I say, I love you. That's grace. That's, a, that's what's at the core of becoming a Christian. You turn to God and say, I love you too. Will you love me? And that relationship with God is based on the love that Jesus has for us where there's enough love for everybody in the pool. So I became a follower of Jesus. I started learning all the fancy terms for what I had done with conversion. But the one that kept coming back to me over and over was this word, grace. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
I underlined that and I said, yeah, that's what God said to me that night. I don't have to be somebody else to be loved. By the grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am. That's the reason the gospel is called good news. You don't have to pretend to be somebody else. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. When he said he didn't deserve to be a leader in the church because of what he had done, what he was really like, well, he was just telling the truth. He's, he's like a friend of mine, Tony Campolo, a famous speaker. And Tony once got up in front of a group of us and said, you know, if you knew who I really was underneath, you wouldn't listen to somebody like me. But that's okay. If I knew who you really were underneath, I wouldn't even talk to people like you. See, as soon as you receive grace, you want to be better. You get love, so you want to love better. As soon as you start to get better, you look around at other people and say, I think you should get better too. And then it becomes about who's better and who's worse, who's good and bad. And we seem to forget that by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I am broken until I die but I am a child of God. People who follow Jesus for a while are constantly in danger of becoming that older brother in the story of the prodigal son, actually pushing people away from the father, pushing people away from grace. Churches are not known for being grace-filled places. Churches become good people trying harder places. And he tells a little story about that. He says... uh, Do we find grace in church? There was a young prostitute on the streets of Chicago where Yancey grew up that had been kicked out of her home as a child and involved in promiscuity and prostitution and developed a drug habit. It was so bad that she wasn't making enough money selling her own body, so she started to sell the body of her little girl. And finally... One day, at the bottom, coming to her senses in the depths of despair, she goes to one of the local missions that gave out food and clothes and shelter and asks, what can I do? What can I do? And one of the volunteers said, have you ever thought about going to church? And this young girl said, church? Why would I go to church? I feel bad enough already. Why would I go to church? That young prostitute's comment stings because she found the weak spot in church, in most churches. David Maines is known as a counselor, and he nails it. He he said, I was driven to the conclusion that the two major causes of most emotional problems among Christians are these. We fail to understand and to receive and to live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness. And then... We fail to give out that unconditional love and forgiveness and grace to other people. We we don't live it out and we don't give it out. Friends, um, I believe that grace is what's needed to heal the wounds in our country and in our families and in our workplaces. And I believe that grace is needed right here at Menlo Church. After this very tough year, grace is needed in you and between you and coming out of you. You ever have trouble getting to sleep? I I, I bet that the Apostle Paul, the only thing we have in common is that he would lie down in some dungeon in the Roman Empire far from home and he couldn't sleep. He'd have nightmares because he'd flash back to that time that he was huddled around a crowd and there was Stephen, the martyr, talking about his faith in Jesus and Paul yelling with the crowd, kill him, kill him, kill him. Remember, it says in the story, Paul stood there approving the killing of Stephen. They put their coats at his feet and he watched the rocks splat into Stephen and bury him and kill him. I don't know how you forget that especially if you were responsible. I wonder how often that kept Paul up at night. I wonder how often he felt ashamed and bad again of pulling moms away from their children and fathers away from their boys, ripping them out of their houses and 
taking them off to be punished just because they wanted to follow this Jesus. I bet there were times when Paul had a hard time sleeping, just like some of you do, just like I do. I need to be reminded again this weekend that I am forgiven, that I am the beloved child of God, and that when I walk through the door, God doesn't say, get over here. You know what you did? But God says, oh, you're here at last. And God smiles when he sees me. I want to live like that. I, I want you to experience that. Grace is not pretending it doesn't happen. Grace is not just saying, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again, because it did. It will. Grace is God saying, it's over. I forgive you. Go back to sleep. Have good dreams. We all need to be reminded of grace over and over and over until it sinks in. And we need to be reminded of grace over and over until it starts to ooze out. The Apostle Paul says, I don't deserve it, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace was not without effect. Grace changes your game. But more important, grace changes the way you keep score. Changes the whole scorecard. His grace, it says, has not been without effect in me. I worked harder than anybody else. No, no, it wasn't me. It was grace working inside of me. So for the rest of his life, Paul went around and saying, you're broken people. I know that. And I know that because I'm broken in more places than you are. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And God's grace changed me, and God's grace can change you. Grace either changes your life or it's not grace at all. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. It's just feeling bad about things or having the right words. Real grace is a gift from heaven. And if it's not shared, unshared grace rots. I love coming here to the West Coast. I'm looking forward to spending time in the whole Bay Area. I, I want to go up to St. Andrews Presbyterian in Marin County and, and meet Annie Lamott, famous uh, Christian author again. Uh, she has a large African-American pastor at, at her church, and uh, the, the pastor told a story once that said, you know what church is all about? Church is the place where grace makes people know who they really are. And Lamont says this, this preacher, when she was seven years old, her best friend got lost and wandered away down the streets of Oakland. My daughter lives in Oakland, and there are a lot of places that are not very safe to be alone at 37 rather than just at seven. And the little boy went further and further away down these streets. The parents were frantic. Everybody was out looking. He just kept turning the wrong way. And finally, after some hours, a police car stops next to him. And the policeman asked if he was lost. And the little boy, tears streaming down, shakes his head. Can we get you home? I don't know where home is. Well, what's your risk? I don't remember. Well, the policeman puts him in the passenger seat, and they start driving up and down the streets. Finally, they turn a corner, and the little boy yells out, There! There! Over there! And he points to a church on the corner. The policeman stops and says, Okay. And the little boy opens the door and says, thanks, this is my church, this is my church. I always know how to get home from here. The gospel of grace is that God comes to you and says, let me take you home from here, wherever here is today. We meet here because God can always bring us home from here. I hope in the weeks and months ahead, we can meet here. And listen again to the God of grace speak to us and give us new life and help us to share the grace that we received. Can I pray for us? Lord, I thank you for this first time with my sisters and brothers and friends at Menlo. And I thank you for reminding me that I don't deserve this that by the grace of God, I am what I am. And your grace has not been without effect. Some of the people, maybe even who tuned in for the first time, feel like they are 
prodigals today, far away from church, and they're fine with that, but far away from God, and, and they don't want to feel bad about themselves anymore. Lord Jesus, I pray for them, and I, I pray just as much for those of us who have been filled with grace and forgotten how to share that grace. I pray that you will help us not to be the older brother or the prodigal son, but that you will fill us with grace and love that will not let us go. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks, folks. the Gospel of John, we read that the Word of God who comes into the world, who is Jesus the Christ, that out of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And so this week, may you experience the depth, the joy, the freedom of God's grace for you this week and always. Amen. <laughs>